Now, sort of a new element that doesn't really correspond to this model that we're talking about in comparing VDCs is an application profile. It's really just a container for endpoint groups, which are essentially connections. We'll talk about that in a second. But this lives inside the bridge domain, and you can have several of them. So tenant, inside a tenant's a VRF. Inside a VRF is a bridge domain and subnets. Also contained in the bridge domain is an application profile, and inside the application profile are endpoint groups. Now, endpoint groups are essentially connections made inside the Cisco ACI fabric. It can be a physical port. It can be a virtual port in VMware or Hyper-V or something like that. It can be a subnet range outside of the Cisco ACI fabric and things like that. Typically, you group these together based on some common requirements, not unlike when you assign interfaces to a VDC. One very common use of EPGs is to create a layer 2 connection. For example, you could have an access port set with an 802.1Q tag for VLAN 100, and then the outside world would see VLAN 100, 100 coming from the port on the switch and would also be sending tag traffic back into it. Now, one important rule is that all the endpoints, all the connections you create and place in the endpoint group can communicate by default. There's nothing special you have to do for them to talk. However, Endpoints in different EPGs, as you see pictured here, cannot communicate by default. There's an implicit deny any. Actually, it's just a blacklist. There's no communication unless you explicitly allow it. In order to have communication between these endpoint groups, these connections inside this hierarchy, you have to configure what's called a contract. And a contract functions a lot like an access list. Now, just as a VLAN is not really exactly the same as a bridge domain, an access list really isn't the same exact thing as a contract, though they do share some characteristics, and it's one way of understanding it. So access lists. What do access lists contain? Here's some syntax here. Well, they contain match criteria. Are you going to match on TCP? Are you going to match on IP? If you're matching on IP, what IP ranges are going to use, you're going to use? If it's TCP or UDP, what port ranges, ICMP, and so forth? You're specifying match criteria. Once you've matched, you'll choose actions. The most common that we're used to is permit and deny, but there's some others as well, including the log keyword. And then finally, there's a direction. You apply this frequently as a packet filter on an interface, and it'll either be inbound or outbound, or you can apply the same one both ways. So think about this, match criteria, actions, and direction. Contracts are similar in that they contain what are called filters. A filter is very much like an access list control entry, an ACE, specifying what protocol, port ranges, and things like that. One of the things you can't use a contract for, it does not allow filtering on IP ranges like access lists do this. So what is the difference? Then you have actions, permit, deny, mark, but permit and deny are going to be the most common even with contracts. And then there's something called labels with consumer and provider that we'll talk about for a minute. So filters, actions, and labels live inside a container called a subject, and the subject lives inside the contract. You can have multiple subjects and obviously multiple filters. And this is the criteria that's used to determine whether traffic is going to go between EPG1 and EPG2. These contracts then are applied to endpoint groups, but they're applied in a specific way. There's a label, there's two types of labels, one's a subject label, just a tag, and the other is this consumer and provider relationship. One has to be consumer and one has to be provider. You can't have consumer to consumer and provider to provider, they won't work. When I first heard this, I could not make sense of it. And then after thinking about it and kind of wrestling with it and reading some good material, I came to the conclusion that just change the terminology to source and destination. If we're talking about TCP here, what is your source port going to be? You don't know. It's from the ephemeral range and it's, and it's chosen. But the destination range is going to be 22 or 23 for Telnet or 80 for web and so forth and so on. So think about how source and destination directionality matters. In the same way, it does directionality matters. You're going to apply the consumer on one side. Excuse me. The, you're going to apply the contract on one side as a consumer. And on the other side as a provider, just think source and destination, and most of the confusing parts of this would clear up. So strictly speaking, Nexus 7000 VDCs and ACI tenants are not interchangeable. They're not identical. There's some important differences we want to point out. First, on the Nexus 7000, a VDC is contained inside a single chassis. It's not living anywhere else. 
In ACI, tenants can live across multiple switches throughout the fabric. The Nexus 7000 VDC is only limited to four or eight instances, depending on how many licenses you have and what kind of hardware you're dealing with, like a Supervisor 1 or 2E. In ACI, numerous instances are possible to hundreds and even, not, yeah, hundreds and even thousands. Next, the Nexus 7000 VDC always contains a default VRF. In ACI, it has to be explicitly defined. For Nexus 7000 VDCs to communicate, they have to be physically connected. So they're standalone, they're isolated from one another, but you can make them communicate if you plug them into one another, the ports that they have assigned to each one. In ACI, you can do logical communication. There's a couple of ways to do this. One of the easiest ones is through the common tenant, which basically can communicate with all the other tenants. So one tenant can't talk to another, but all of them can talk to the common tenant. So you can create that connectivity that way. Also, the Nexus 7000 virtual device contexts are built on a distributed architecture, just like we've done for years. In ACI, everything is a very centralized architecture. The Nexus 7000 VDCs are only available on the Nexus 7000 switch. They're not available on the 5000 or 3000 or the 9000. And Cisco ACI is only available on the Cisco Nexus 9000 and in fact requires a specific software image. And then finally, Nexus 7000 VDCs are typically configured at the CLI of the switch that they're on. In Cisco ACI, you cannot configure the switches directly. Instead, you configure the controller or APIC, Application Policy Infrastructure Controller. And you can do this through the GUI, at the CLI, or through APIs. Just sort of some contrast between the two. So what did we talk about? First, Cisco ACI can seem a little strange and unfamiliar at first. I myself have lived through that. Second, some common concepts exist between Cisco Nexus 1000 VDCs, Cisco Nexus 7000 VDCs, and Cisco ACI. So there's some correspondence that you can kind of use it to wrap your head around. Next, Cisco ACI uses a series of logical constructs for networking, like the 7000 VDCs, there are tenants and VRFs, bridge domains, and so forth. Comparisons between these two technologies are not exact. So this is more of an analogy to help understanding than absolutely how things operate, but it does give you a better idea of how things work. And finally, I've been working with Cisco ACI since it came out, so it's been around a while, and I used to get the question about, is it just a fad or is it here to stay? Well, it's here to stay. It's widely installed, thousands of customers, and it's something people are working with every day. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.